Lord be with you. It's good to be with everyone on this first Sunday after Christmas. It's uh, still Christmas. We're going to linger uh, and uh, dwell on uh, Christmas for uh, at least another week today. And of course, next Sunday, the second Sunday after Christmas as well. Um, Pastor Nate's away today. He hasn't had any time off since he arrived on June 30th. So. Uh, he's had a little bit of Christmas with uh, his family, particularly with Eric's family in Chattanooga, Tennessee. So he's away um, this Sunday, uh, much deserved rest, and we keep him and the family uh, in our prayers. I want to remind everybody that the offering and envelopes have arrived finally. They are over in the disciples' hall, so at the conclusion of the service, if you'd like to go over, uh, your names are on them, and they're uh, ready to go for it. So, um, also, we do have New Year's Eve service, 7 o'clock, uh, Tuesday, the 31st, of course. Uh, but it's just, uh, um, I like being here on, on New Year's Eve, and I think you will too. It's uh, an opportunity to thank God for the outpouring of God's blessing in the year of our Lord 2019, and to ask His blessings, continued blessings upon us in ongoing in the year of our Lord uh, 2020. So uh, that service is a uh, it's the sound of God. That's the communion service, like all of our services, the communion service, except our uh, second and Um I want to just take this opportunity to thank everyone for the cards, uh, for the gifts, uh, for a beautiful, beautiful Advent and Christmas season. Uh, beginning with uh, Advent by candlelight, um, uh, Body Art got started really well with that. And that was a beautiful event. Uh, Maxwell's decorating outside the choir, the musicians, the bells, the fellowship committee, outreach community, uh, committee, those, the youth who decorated the trees, uh, everyone who helped to make this such a special season. Thank you so very, uh, very much. It's just been an incredible uh, time. Um, those are all of my announcements. We're still in Christmas season, so we're going to bring a little bit more Christmas uh, Bethlehem today. Let's stand and show the peace of the Lord.
Holy and gracious God, I confess that I have sinned against you this day. Some of my sin I know, the thoughts and words and deeds of which I am ashamed. But some is known only to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, I ask for your forgiveness. Deliver me your mercy and restore me by your grace that I am in my sinful life. Bring me to everlasting life. Amen. <clears throat> Almighty God and His mercy has given His Son to die for you and for His sake forgives you all of your sins. As a call and ordained servant of Christ and by His authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. May He who began this good work within you bring it to completion on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. The peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you. Having heard those beautiful words of absolution, we stand and continue singing. Now sing, we now rejoice. Like livestock that go down into the valley, 
the Spirit of the Lord gave them rest. So you led your people to make for yourself a glorious name. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading is recorded in St. Paul's letter to the Galatians, the fourth chapter, as he says that when the fullness of time came, God sent his Son. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the second chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. When the wise men had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt, and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious, and he sent to kill all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and loud lamentation, Rachel, weeping for her children, she refused to be comforted, because they are no more. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, where those who sought the child's life were dead. And he rose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. And he went and lived in a city called Nazareth, that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled. He shall be called a Nazarene. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Let us now join together and confess our holy Christian faith to one another and with Christians throughout the world in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, Light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And at the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the Lord.
with joy and gladness that by grace through faith in Jesus Christ we can now call you Father. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Our text for today is St. Paul's letter to the Galatians. We read the text a few minutes ago. I have to say before I read this, it's uh, kind of refreshing to get back in the New Testament throughout Advent uh, and even uh, Christmas Eve. I preached on the Old Testament a couple of times on Isaiah, on Malachi, another time on Zechariah. I hear the prophecies about uh, the coming birth of the Savior. And now in this Christmas season, the prophecies have been fulfilled. And so Paul comes to us with a little a Christmas message himself today from Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. When the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive the full adoption as sons. This is our text. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The Sunday after Christmas is no time to just move on. Uh, there might be some who are ready to move on uh, from Christmas. As I was pulling out of our uh, development this morning, I saw a couple of Christmas trees already out on the curbside. I'm just not ready for that yet. I heard someone who said that they, uh, they went to Walmart on Christmas Eve. They had already <coughs> taken down all the Christmas uh, uh, ornaments and uh, decorations and they were setting up for Valentine's Day. But I'm not quite ready to move on. In fact, I don't think now we don't take down our trees until uh, after Epiphany uh, on, uh, on January 6th. I mean, that's the star that led the wise men to see Jesus, right? To see uh, the light of the world. So it's just wonderful to keep up the lights and keep celebrating Christmas until. And so today is a day to linger a little bit, a day to dwell on the miracle of Christ's birth. And so you get a little bit more Christmas today. But as I began reading Galatians, I, I have to be honest with you and, and tell you that as I read it, I really, I wish that Paul would have given us a little bit more Christmas. Come on, Paul, couldn't you have talked just a little bit more about it? But maybe, maybe we can chalk it up to humility, which is a problem for an apostle who wasn't an eyewitness of our Lord's ministry, an eyewitness of Jesus. He saw Jesus in his Damascus Road experience, but he was not an eyewitness to the ministry uh, of our Lord while he was on this earth. Or maybe Paul understood his own inherent limitations. After all, how could he compete with Luke's Shepherds and angels and swallowing clouds. But what Paul does have to say about Christmas, he says in one sentence, he sums it up in one beautiful sentence that is our text for today. This is a Christmas message right here. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. There you have it. That's the nativity right there without all the bells and tinsel. I think it's because Paul would have us know that Christmas is more than just a feeling. For Paul, Christmas is the incarnation. It's the virgin birth. He talks about it in that, in that one sentence about Christmas. For Paul, it's redemption and atonement and the vicarious satisfaction about Jesus satisfying all the demands of the law. Jesus satisfying all the penalty of sin that you and I deserve, making this perfect sacrifice on the cross. That's what it's about for Paul. And all of that then results in our own inclusion, yours and mine, into the family of God. As he said, we are all children of God because of Jesus, because of the one who was born and lived and died and rose and ascended for us and the one who will come back. Sure, like a lot of Lutherans, like a lot of Lutherans, Paul is a bit heavy on the doctrine. But I think there's good reason for that. Paul had good reason for that, given all the false teaching that was 
taking place in his day. I don't know about you, but Christmas makes me feel very nostalgic. Very, very reflective. In fact, while I was watching the children's Christmas pageant this year, sitting in the back pew, realizing that this was my 20th Christmas here at Bethlehem, and also realizing that this was the first children's Christmas pageant in which I had never had a part. The first one that I didn't have a part in. Don't feel, don't feel sorry for me. It actually felt good to sit back and to watch and take it all in. And I have to say that Pastor Nate and Erica did a fantastic job along with Kathleen and especially the children who reenacted the Christmas story so beautifully. But I, I did a lot of reflecting as I was sitting in that back pew, and I, I actually began to wonder if the early Christians had Chris, Christmas pageants like we do. I mean, given the beauty of Luke and the drama of Matthew, maybe the early Christians really did stage Christmas pageants just like we do. And if they did, I wonder, especially as I was preparing this sermon and reading this text from Paul, I wondered what role might Paul have played? Being a tough guy, could Paul have imagined himself as Joseph, the guardian and protector of the little holy family? Or as a scholar, would he have fancied himself to be a wise man? Or given his own dramatic conversion, perhaps he'd be a shepherd surprised by the heavenly host. But on second thought, it's hard to think that Paul was a poor and lowly anything, much less a shepherd. And unlike the wise man, he did not go out of his way to worship Jesus, believe me. It was our Lord who found Paul. Paul was walking in the wrong direction. There was no man that said, Paul, you just need a little bit of Jesus. You better go find it. Quite the opposite. The way it works is Jesus finds us and often finds us when we least expect it. And that certainly is the case with the Apostle Paul. Because unlike Joseph, Paul did nothing to protect Jesus. It's quite the opposite. And I think that deep down, Paul Paul must have known the role that he was called to play. When he heard the news of Jesus, Herod was disturbed and all of Jerusalem with him. And when Paul heard the news of Jesus, he too was disturbed. And Herod was found by orchestrating the deaths of hundreds, if not thousands, of little boys under the age of two lived in Bethlehem, as the text says, in the surrounding region. But Paul responded by breathing murderous threats against the churches and against Christians. Now, I really don't know much about early Christmas pageants, <coughs> but we do know that Paul actually staged a little passion play of his own. Back then, the stage name was Saul, and the co-star was Stephen. In fact, the day after Christmas, by the way, is the Feast of St. Stephen. And in the first act of this passion play, Stephen preaches, and Saul incites a teeth-gnashing mob. And in the second act, Paul beams with pride as Stephen is dragged from the city. And finally, Paul holds the coats as he incites others to throw the stones. And Stephen, according to script, can be heard praying, do not hold this sin against them. No, Saul didn't get the chance to stuff, snuff out the life of Mary's boy child, Jesus Christ, but he did 
the next best thing. Because the stones thrown at Stephen were aimed at Christ. How would you like to have that on your conscience? Have you ever wondered what it must have been like to be Paul? I mean, how often have we awakened in the middle of the night in a cold sweat thinking about what we have done? I wonder what Paul saw when he looked at him today. He saw an innocent baby who had died as an innocent man. I'm sure he saw the face of Stephen. And I'm sure that he saw the face of Jesus who said to, to, to Saul over and over and over again, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? For Paul the sinner, Christmas had to be more than just a precious moment or a hallmark holiday. Santa was a lot of fun. I, I have no problem with Santa. Not at all. But when you've got blood on your hands, the question of who's been naughty or nice really doesn't come close to getting at the root of the problem. You see, a real sinner needs more. A real sinner needs more than what this world has to offer. And in fact, a real sinner needs more than what a lot of churches today have to offer. Paul the sinner needed more than Christ as a heartwarming example of how to live a good life. It was way too late for that. What Paul needed, what you and I need, is the dawn of redeeming grace. He didn't need the theory of the atonement. He needed the atonement itself. He needed, as Paul writes today in our text, he needed one born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law. Did you notice when you went to the Christmas Eve service or perhaps the Christmas morning service that there were women clutching tissues and there were a few men with tears in their eyes, handkerchiefs in their hands. Kind of goes with the territory. Candlelight songs bring memories of loved ones who are no longer with us or loved ones who are far away. When the songs of children take us back to when our own children were little, singing in choirs and participating in pageants, or maybe far enough back, like myself, when I sang in the cheer choir and participated in the pageants in my home church. And so it is along with the eggnog, Christmas serves a generous helping of the song. And some of it is joyful and some of it is sad. I think the nostalgia can be saddened when garnished with mar. You know what mar is? It's that bitter herb that the Jews eat at Passover to remind them of their time in Egypt living under slavery. But for us, it's that bitter herb of memories that we just as soon pass over. When we think of what once was, we're reminded of the times that we harmed others, the times that we said something we shouldn't have said, or didn't say something that we needed to have said, times when we acted selfishly, those times when we interfered and just made matters worse. And so thinking of what might be, we're reminded that our own little world is a mess. We help to make it that way. And there is no one else to blame. And as we reflect, perhaps we'll conclude that life hasn't always been such a wonderful life after all. So what do we do with that? How do we handle that? And that's heavy stuff at Christmas time. 
But there's an answer. There is an answer to this. I mean, when, when confronted with the ghosts of our past, we might choose the path of Scrooge and vow to amend our sinful lives. But what if it's too late? I mean, that's what Scrooge did. He vowed to amend his sinful life, but at the end of the story, remember that he was relieved to find Tiny Tim still alive. But Stephen was dead. And Paul's nightmare was his life. And there was nothing he could do about it. It's the kind of thing that could bring a grown man to tears. It's they who cry out, for I know my transgression of my sin is ever before me against you. You only have I sinned, O Lord. It's Peter hearing the rooster crow for a second time and then breaking down into to bitter tears in his repeated denial. It's the Paul in all of us. It's pushing, it's the times we push Jesus away. It's the Lord I think so little of. It's the times when I put myself before my Lord. But God had a plan. And this is the gospel. God had a plan. He sent his son, Jesus, into the world. And he sent him not in power, but in weakness, not to demand payback, but to make payment for our sins. For the times I sinned and thought, word and deed, for the times I shoved him away, for the times when I, I, I pushed him away from being the, the number one person in my life, the times I pushed him away from being my Lord and my Savior. God sent his son into the world not to breathe murderous threats against us, but to bring peace and goodwill to us. And that's the gospel. That's what the prophets were talking about. So I want you to hear that shofar of the, of the prophets today, the good news of the gospel. The proclamation of Isaiah that, that his name would be called Jesus and he would be called Emmanuel. I want you hear the, to hear the trumpet of the saints to come to Bethlehem to see the birth that the angels sing about. Cry for sorrow, but weep for joy. Weep for the joy that no one can ever take away from you. The joy that you have in this Savior. Receive with Paul the gift of forgiveness, the gift of innocence, because the guilt is washed away. The shame has been covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. So we never again have to wake up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat, worrying about the things that we have done. What child is this who lay to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping? Who is this one sleeping on Mary's lap? Paul tells us, the one born of a woman, born under the law, that he might redeem those who were under the law. Nail spear shall pierce him through the cross be born for me, for you. That's the good news. That's the theology of the cross. It's not a theology of glory telling you how to how the rules to live your life. It's a theology of the cross that reminds you that when you didn't follow those rules, when you fell under the curse of the law, that Jesus came as your Savior and nails and spears pierced him through, that that cross was born for me and for you. That's the good news. And because it's the good news and because I started this sermon with a wish, I have two more wishes for you. The first one is, I want to wish you along with Paul himself. A Merry Christmas. And the second wish that I have for you is that you would have a blessed new year. May I do so for Jesus' sake.
your mercy, Lord. Hear the prayers of your people. And grant to us all things needful and beneficial through Jesus Christ our Lord. For the church, the people of his promise, to whom he has revealed his Son as Savior and Redeemer, that we may enjoy the gift of good and faithful ministers, and that the Lord may prosper the word and bring to fruition the proclamation of your word in every place and time. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the nation and our leaders, that the Lord may grant them wisdom in their pursuit of justice, and for the cause of peace in the world, and relief for those who suffer oppression. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the protection of life, from its natural beginning to its natural end, for the special protection of the unborn, for mothers with child, for the safekeeping of mother and child during childbirth, and for the comfort of God's grace to those who suffer miscarriage or the death of a child, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the renewal of our fellowship as the body of Christ, for families, for husbands and wives, for the newly engaged, for those desiring to be married, and for the lonely who yearn to know the comfort of friendship and family, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the sick and those who suffer, that the Lord may grant them healing in accordance with his will. And for those who give aid and care to the sick, Especially today, we pray for the lonely, the sick among us, Sue Eichen, Martha Fisher, Jeannie Roman, Norman and Joan Matmuller, and Ingrid Betcher. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the grieving who suffer the loss of those they love, including Tammy Moe and her family at the death of Tammy's mother, Bobby Dwight, on Christmas Day. Also on this Holy Innocent Sunday, we pray for those who mourn infants and children, and for those in their last days, that the Lord may give them peace at the last, and for the day when finally we shall be reunited with those who died in Christ, and be raised with them to everlasting life. Let us pray to the Lord. The Lord, have mercy. For our communion this day upon the body and blood of Christ, that we may receive this sacrament with faith and be strengthened by it, and that the Lord may soon bring unity of faith and doctrine so that all divisions may cease and we may be fully one at the altar. Let us pray to the Lord. The Lord have mercy. For the Holy Spirit to increase our joy and sustain us in this joy and thanksgiving throughout the days of this Christmas season, until that day when at last the Lord returns in his glory as Lord and Judge of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Hear us, O Lord, for we are the people of your promise and the children whom you have redeemed through the salvation accomplished through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever.
sacrifice shed for you for the remission of all your sins. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Need all thy grace in you, Christ. Receive the sign of the cross in your forehead and in your heart, and that's pure baptism. Christ, your child of God. Take an ease on your cross. The true blood of Jesus shed for you, Lord, for the remission of all of your sins. Live in that joy and peace.
Go in peace and joy to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.